Hello, everyone, and welcome to 2021 Late Night with the Old Masters. I'm Claire Bainey. And I'm Andrew Beering, and we make up the evening events co-chairs on the Old Masters Central Committee. We can't, can't wait to share the 2021 class of Old Masters with you tonight. Late Night with the Old Masters is the pinnacle event of the Old Masters program, where Purdue students are given the opportunity to learn from the Old Masters. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Old Masters program, we have been on Purdue's campus since 1950 with the mission to enrich traditions, unite generations, and empower Boilermakers. This program is a unique way to honor Purdue's most distinguished alumni and friends of the university who have achieved numerous successes throughout their careers. These distinguished alumni are known to us as Old Masters. Tonight, these Old Masters will be sharing their stories, how they got to where they are today. And now let's welcome panel one. Elaine Sorg, SVP and President of U.S. Commercial Operations at AbbVie. <laughs> professor Gabiza Ijeda, Distinguished Professor of Plant Breeding and Genetics in International Agriculture in Purdue University's Department of Agronomy and a World Food Prize Laureate. Kathy Calvin, former 16-year president and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. <laughs> Emily Maddox Liggett, CEO and founder of Liggett Advisors and board member of Kaiser Aluminum, Ultra Clean Technologies, Materion, and L5 Lab. And Tommy Lebemoff, CEO and managing partner of Exactus Advisors in Chicago. Thank you so much for being here today. We are thrilled to get to share you with the campus. So again, thank you. As we start tonight, we are so moved by the experiences that you've had of success and failure throughout your careers. And so for those, in the, for those of us in the audience who are wanting to do equally purposeful work as you have, how do you recommend getting started? Tom, um, you want to start us off? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> it, you know, if it's an entrepreneurial um, focus, you need to be ready to put all your assets on the line, put everything at risk. If you have a house, maybe you need to mortgage your house. Maybe you need to max out your credit cards. I've done that twice. Um, it's not a um, very uh, nice thing to do. Um, I've been broken down on my knees in front of my beautiful wife um, that immediately told me to get your ass back up. <laughs> um, so it, uh, there's a lot of uh, struggles that come with it, but a lot of rewards, the, the old saying, risk you know, you'll get a lot of rewards out of it, but you have to know what's going to come and be ready for it. So just make sure your mindset is there. Purdue will teach you how to think and how to deal with that. And I'm just very happy to be here. Okay. Well, I'll, go, I'll go next. So I think it was Frederick Buchner that said, your vocation will be where you're greatest joy meets the world's greatest needs. And I, you know, it's a big statement, but I think the thought that you can be excited and look forward to what you're doing during the day and it's got some meaningfulness to it. And I think just being self-aware of things that, you know, work for you and, you know, aware of where you get joy and not being around people that speak truth to you about that, being flexible, you know, and not getting caught up into something, being willing to try something new. And I think, you know, stretching and getting out of your comfort zone, because I think you're capable of so much more than you think you are. So go for it. 
So I'm going to add a few comments along those lines. You know, I think um, as you start out, you can strive for significance as long as you're also striving for success. And you can strive for success as long as you're also striving for significance. This is not an either or world anymore. And so we don't have to decide I'm going to create value or I'm going to serve others. Everybody can do both, and they can do it in lots and lots and lots of careers. The world is crying for you to find significance and purpose in what you're doing, and you have a right to demand that of the people you work with and that you work for. So I think it's, it's a very exciting time because the world needs so many things today to make sure that we're achieving something that's good for people and planet, as well as finding profit. And you can find your true north and your passion in, in many different ways. And it won't be the first thing you do, and it may not be the last thing you do. This is going to be a lifetime experience for you. And go for it. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> to add on, I think focusing more on the students here, I would start with advising the student to get the best education that you can get. In other words, come to Purdue. <laughs> yeah. And the goal is to make yourself the best professional that you can be. And to be able to do that, even though our curriculum sometimes may not make that possible, breadth is very important. To try to broaden yourself in various disciplines, particularly for those of us in the sciences, we get a lot narrow as a result of lacking that bread that we need. And as you get into decision making and so on, being able to impact or produce greater impact, the bread is very important. The perspectives of whatever it is, the technologies that you have, and bringing in the social dimension, the human dimension is very important, the environmental dim dimension. And these are important. And so having that kind of bread, even whether you get it from class or in, on your own, broadening yourself, the more you get to higher decision making, the more important that becomes. And as a result, I think that's, that's a good start to, from there on. And then as you begin to practice and trying to make sure that you are as purpose driven as you can be for the goals that you set for yourself, persistence is a good virtue to have. And as you do things, yes, it may be important the responsibilities are there and so on. Try to do things for the right reasons, regardless of whatever that reason that you identify as being very important to your values. Try to do things for the right reasons and not for the immediate goal that may be driving you, even though that you may not avoid those sometimes. But try to remain true to that value that you instill in yourself, in yourself from the beginning. I would also echo what my fellow O Masters have said. I think you have to know who you are and be confident in who you are and find your passion in life. And I would encourage you then to find employment that aligns with that passion. How do you feel when you're motivated? How do you feel when you're challenged? And how do you want to contribute? For me, um, having received my Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy, it was a five-year degree, and that's a lot of time to put in. And I felt most motivated when I was helping patients. And as a consequence of that, I always wanted to have a career that I could tie a golden thread between my actions and ultimately impacting the patient. And it didn't matter if I was in research and development as I was for part of my career trying to bring a new medicine to market. It didn't matter if I was in process engineering fixing problems that might stall medical development or if I was in the commercial enterprise trying to help patients recognize uh, when they needed to consult their doctor or providing medical information. The ability to always find that golden thread to me really matters and I would encourage you to think about what motivates you and then try to find the alignment with your prospective employers. Awesome, thank you, Elaine. To kind of bounce it right back to you, you talked about that golden thread. 
patient access and equity are major challenges in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, and you've talked, you know, talked openly about interacting with patients being one of your biggest motivators. How do you balance um, both patient access and equity along with business objectives? Well, I don't think that the two have to be discontinuous. I think we can do good for patients while also doing good for shareholders. And when you work for a for-profit institution like the pharmaceutical companies in the world, you have to recognize that that shareholder money is what enables you to invest. The profit of your medicine enables you to invest in the next cures. For every 100 new products that are developed in the labs, approximately nine will make it to late stage clinical trials. And if you're lucky, one of them will make it to market. And it costs about $2 billion in order to develop a new medicine. We also recognize, though, that patients need access to our medicine. I'm very proud of what we do at AbbVie. Uh, last year alone, we helped over 155,000 Americans by giving them $4.2 billion worth of free medicine. And that is a lot that we've done charitably. In addition, we've donated over last year $76 million worth of medicines to 27 countries. And we use uh, copay or financial assistance for individuals that maybe can't afford the out-of-pocket for our medicines. And that also is well over $2 billion collectively across the portfolio. So I think that there's a way to meet patients where they are. I think the other responsibility that we have is that we just don't develop cures for diseases that are in what I would call the developed world. We need to look globally and we need to invest in countries in order to help solve some of their challenging health problems. And we have a belief that if we go into a country to do a clinical trial, then we have an obligation to get the product registered and to be able to bring it to market for those patients. We don't believe in going into an underserved market and utilizing patients in clinical trials and exposing them to medicines without being able to provide medical care to them post uh, approval by their local regulatory authorities. And I think that those principles of science and those principles of business can really come together. And I, I'm incredibly proud of, of our company um, and also proud of our industry and how our industry has responded to the challenges with COVID to have developed the diagnostics, to have developed the, di uh, the vaccines in really record-breaking time. It typically takes a minimum of five, but upwards of 10 years to bring a new vaccine to market. And when I look at what Pfizer or Moderna, J&J &J have done, I think all of us are incredibly fortunate and owe a debt of gratitude to those, in, those uh, scientists, the individuals at the companies, and, and to some extent, the federal government as well with Operation Warp Speed, although uh, Pfizer did not participate, they, they funded it all on their own. So I think it's a great time to be a scientist and an employee in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine, I appreciate the note of persistence that you brought up that's required for research and development. And persistence is also what you touched on, Dr. Ajeta. You have definitely shown this through the successes that you've had, such as being a World Food Prize laureate. And I want to know, in the face of huge success, how have you been able to continue to push boundaries without, uh, while, while staying motivated and also humble? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I can... Uh, provide a list that would work for everybody, but these have been my guiding principles. And that is, don't have an inflated view of yourself or your work. Try, don't measure your success with the wrong currency. Have a guiding light of your own that you follow. Be persistent in the pursuit of that value to do good or to succeed in the ways that you describe, you, you design for yourself. And as you indicated also, be humble. And as you celebrate your success, celebrate your success, but don't gloat. And as you counter challenges and failures, get up, don't, but don't be hard on yourself. And I think these are the, the guiding principles that I have used in, in much of what I have done in my career. Beautiful said. Beautiful. Kind of changing. Uh, yeah. 
switching gears a little bit um, to Tommy, this is for you. I'm curious. Um, you have started your own company, companies, plural. How did you handle the struggle that comes with entrepreneurship? And then as a follow-up, what is your recommendation to students interested in entrepreneurship? Well, part of the, uh, the introduction, I, I talked about becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, you have to put it all on the line. Um, but you do need to surround yourself um, with individuals that can fill gaps that you have. Um, I really don't believe in weaknesses. Um, we all have strengths, and we, know ne we need to know when to turn things on and turn them off. Um, and you need to be very self-aware in, in how you think about yourself and the partners that you work with. Um, I have two um, partners that I work with that are my best friends. How does it happen that way? It just happened. Um, so I think as, you're, as you think through, I think Elaine, you, you had mentioned, you know, do what you're happy with, right? Find something that you're passionate about and follow it. And just as, as uh, Emily would say, you know, just go do it, right? <laughs> Kathy too, just go do it. Um, and Purdue has done a wonderful, um, you know, for, for me, it's lifelong learning and how to learn. And you should be so lucky that you're here because you have a lifelong path. And if it's entrepreneurship, you're gonna to have to take risk and deal with the struggles. Just know what you're, you're doing and stay strong. Don't give up. You're gonna fail, continue to go. I've failed too many times, but I've had business partners, I've had my family. The strength that you have around you um, is really important. Emily, what are, what are your thoughts based on your own entrepreneurial experiences? Yeah, so I agree with a, a lot, uh, what Tommy said. And uh, you know, I would say what, something different about me, perhaps, than Tommy having started so many businesses is I tend to be the second CEO. I'm not the one that is doing the science experiment. I like to come in once the science is proven. And the question is, <laughs> can the company be a commercial success? Right? Can you manufacture it at a low cost at, high enough quality? Can you find customers that will write you a check to pay for that? Can you stay ahead of the competition and, and the changing world? So I really love that sort of getting people to work together on a common goal. People diverse with different interests and, you know, and able to accomplish that. That's the part I really love about entrepreneurship. And I also have learned that it, you know, you have to have it, be willing to take some risk, and Tommy talked about this too. I found out I have more of an appetite for risk than I realized, <laughs> having grown up in a pretty conservative farm family, right, where you didn't want to take risks. So I, I learned that about myself. I think for those wanting to start here at Purdue, because I think you know if you have the bug to sort of create something that hasn't existed before, right? And you see a need and you really want to fill that need, right, and solve that problem. You know, Purdue's got an amazing amount of support here for entrepreneurship, right? From a certificate program to, you know, an entrepreneurship center to business plan competitions to the foundry. So there's a lot of resources here to avail yourself of because they're free and they want you to be successful. So, you know, I'd say, you know, raise your hand, join the fraternity, you know, get in, there's a entrepreneurship fraternity, um, you know, learn about entrepreneurship and, and try it, especially here, because I think here you can make small mistakes, right? And it is hard to run out of money for sure, right? So that's um, <laughs> no question about that, you know? So I would just encourage you to, to give it a try, get to see some friends, you know, find people that are different than you, that think differently than you. And that diversity is real, right? Where you can attack a problem from many different ways and find many different solutions. It's great to hear both of that, or that from both of you, Tommy and Emily, about how we can make a great impact. And that makes me think about Kathy and Dr. Ajeta, your work internationally. And given that experience, can you tell us about how you have, or can you tell us about what you're most proud of, actually, in regards to your tremendous impact to your global work and the legacy that you have? Would you like to go first? Sure. <laughs> the true leader. As, uh... As someone at the tail end of my career, and I look back on the, on the journey that I had and, and the opportunities that I've had to engage in so many 
uh, global development events. I can't help it but feel content on the path I have traveled. But then I appreciate the fact that when I realize much of what I have done for which I have been credited happened during my time at Purdue, during my Purdue tenure, that a lot of the things that I've involved in, whether it is in my Purdue responsibilities in the mission of the university, teaching, research, and engagement, or even in the other global engagement activities, to a great extent, much of that was using the programs and platform that Purdue, others before me had set up Purdue, and using those is what opportunities that, I, that I've had. And particularly really do pay due credit for Purdue in allowing me to engage early on in my career with my interest in global engagement to engage in various international organizations earlier on. At a time when many may consider going that early in your career may not be to your benefit academic uh, uh, journey here. But I, that allowed me to do that. What that made me, I made contacts all over in many of these agencies and programs around the world. And I meet and work with people who are, have great wisdom, insights. And so those have been very educational for me. I build on them and trying to be, to be of service to programs that are very close and dear to my heart. And, and as a result, that was appreciated in some of the places that I have been in, involved in. So looking back, I have great satisfaction in much of what I have done, but I'm very grateful to Purdue giving me the platform that it has, and I feel that I have done for myself, for my family, and for the programs that are important to me. And yet, I also realize that I have served the university with honor and distinction, and, uh, and, and um, I'm very proud of those accomplishments, and, and also uh, the fact that I, I had put the name of Purdue University on, you know, on, on notice yes, in, in places that I've been engaged in. So I really don't have any particular one to cite, but I think to directly answer your question, a lot of, even though a lot of the recognition I got is in this outside engagement, I can tell you that the teaching programs that I've been involved in, I have some unique educational programming that I've been involved in through my time here at Purdue. For about 10 years, I taught summer school at University of Wisconsin that was sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. At Purdue, for about a dozen years, or maybe uh, six, eight years, there was an educational program that was supported by McKnight Foundation. A beautiful educational program, about 12 faculty working together, trained about 12 individuals, postdocs and graduates. The placement of those people now, in many places, including at Purdue, they have some of the, the best professionals in their respective field, and that is, is where I would put the glory and the legacy of my contributions in some way. These are good, great people before they came to my program, but the fact that I had something with them and, and contributed to their uh, development and growth had given me immense satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you know, I've traveled around the world and I've seen Purdue in action in places in Africa, and with such pride, looking at food and hunger, the soils, the environment, sustainability, it's, it's, it's impressive and it's important that Purdue has prioritized bringing its expertise around the world. And my, my world has been to support and advocate for the work that you are doing, the universities are doing, and the private sector, the private sector has become a major player in global development for all the right reasons, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. We will all benefit if we build more middle-class societies. We'll all benefit if women and girls can be healthy, stay alive, and have families that they can grow. We'll all, be benefit, we'll all benefit if schools are available to, to boys and girls equally. And so I've been excited to see in the last 20 years, as poverty has reduced and prosperity has grown, it's because of a collaboration between universities, the private sector, nonprofits, great nonprofits and, and charities around the world, governments, and of course the United Nations, which has created the overview sustainable development goals under which we can all work together to reach these, these 
change uh, at attributes of our future. So I think it's a totally exciting time because we're not all working separately anymore. We're all working together. And I think the real beneficiaries will be the next generation of leaders who will have had schooling, had education, and had nutrition, and be ready to take on the world in partnership with all of us. So you guys are going to have the chance to really be part of it. I urge you to take global opportunities when you find them. This is, this is your moment, and the world is calling on you to help bring those ideas back home. We can learn a lot from what happens around the world and taking some of our best ideas out there as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Going back to Emily, um, you have been and are a mentor to many companies and individuals. What is the importance of mentorship and how has a mentor impacted you? Okay, so I have been blessed with amazing mentors here at Purdue and then in my careers. You know, people willing to give me advice, help me see things I didn't see, ask me some thought provoking questions. And it's been a pleasure then to, you know, be an, invited to be a mentor to some first time women CEOs and to see them shine, where I can share mistakes I've made so they can make new mistakes <laughs> and different mistakes. And I've had the privilege of working with different student groups who are, you know, have ideas for entrepreneurship. And sometimes it's helpful to have a sort of an objective third party to, to run ideas by. And what if we do this? You know, how do we think about the value proposition, right? How do, how do we think about where we create value versus other things? And so, you know, for me, it's just been super fun to sort of give back a little bit and, and hopefully share some of the scars <laughs> that I have. And, and help student teams keep that enthusiasm and that fresh view on things with a little dose of reality moving forward. Well said. Kathy, I think back to your experience, and not only have you worked internationally, but you've also worked in nonprofit, the nonprofit sector, uh, public sector, as well as private sector. And I'm just wondering, how did you, how are you able to use your transferable skills and translate your skills across sectors and still find such success? Hmm. Well, somebody once called me a tri-sector athlete, and I thought, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I want to be that. And, and actually, I recommend it because you will learn something different working in each sector. Each sector has different language. Each sector works at a different pace. And each sector uses different tools. But all of them are actually trying to reach similar outcomes. And, and so if you've been in the public sector, you know how important it is to have norms and, and values that are set by policy. If you're in the private sector, you know how important it is to have the right people and financing and technology. And if you're in the nonprofit sector, you know that you're listening to the recipients on the ground and feeding that back in so that there's a, there's a network loop. And I, I just love the idea of, of seeing the three work together. Now, it's not always easy, and it's not always immediately the, right, the, the clearest solution. But I think as, as you go forward, the dichotomy between the three sectors is actually shrinking. The private sector and the nonprofit sector are both problem-solving sectors at, at, their, at their heart, as is government. And so, you know, it used to be that you could say the, the private sector had the market cornered on efficiency and the nonprofit sector had the, corner, the market cornered on compassion. Well, it's not that simple anymore. There are many companies that care deeply about the communities in which they're working, and there are many nonprofits that are getting to be better businesses. So I think you have the opportunity to kind of weave through these and expect and bring each of them closer together to really be about what we should all be about, which is solving the world's problems and finding new and exciting solutions. So that's how I think about it. Yeah. Well, and I asked that question because on the podcast, Kathy, on our Old Masters podcast, mentioned <laughs> of the value of being a horizontalist. And I thought that was just genius. Um, but basically, you're getting at the point of the value of transferable skills so that way they can shine in all different areas. So to bring it back to everyone, how have you been able to do that throughout your careers? Yeah, horizontalist, uh, for me, it, it's important. There was, you know, in uh, consulting, you have to have depth in certain areas. You cannot be... Um, depth and skills in all areas of the consulting, it's, it's impossible. Um, so having that breadth does give you the uh, utility player 
that you, you can be moving from one um, uh, position or understanding one part of the business, taking that to the other part of the business. But you also need to have some depth uh, and find what you love and that reputation, whether you're a fixer, whether you're a closer, whether you're in sales, find that and go for it. But um, you know, I kind of grew in business with that broad perspective, but I had some depth in areas. Now, over time, I've lost those depths, um, and that's why you surround yourself with a great team. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. awesome. Emily, what about you? Yeah. So I, you know, I think it's a great idea, and I, as I thought about it, for me, I think. Some of them are skills I learned at Purdue, critical thinking, problem solving skills. You know, the ability to sort of objectively look at something and look at the root cause. It, and you know, what, what are we trying to accomplish? And I think other transferable skills are the, what I'd call the soft skills, um, which I also call the hard skills, <laughs> um, which is the, you know, wor working with a team, working with different people, right? Showing respect. You know, finding ways to ask difficult questions, uncomfortable questions without being disagreeable. You know, so all of those things is get, you know, getting these different folks, sometimes from public and private and nonprofit worlds, to communicate and have a shared vision and figure out how we're going to move forward from that. And I think those are transferable skills that have been very helpful. And a related concept is, is to have a portfolio career. There are so many parts of your career that aren't about going up the ladder, but are actually more like a lattice, and you move from this skill to that mm -hmm. skill, and you build your portfolio of strengths and skills. There are some, some that you won't have, and you'll build it around you. But I think if you can think about going through your career carrying this portfolio with you, and it may be some of the things you're doing here on campus. You're, you're a yoga instructor. Well, there's something there that's awesome and helpful to, to a future career as much as your chemical engineering degree. So I think you need to think more broadly about what you're putting in your portfolio and that you'll be offering future employers as well as the world. Dr. Ojeda? Uh, more of the same. I think, uh, you know, as I had said earlier when I was speaking to students, you know, as you get older and, and are beginning to be identified as someone with insights or a thought leader and so on, what is coming through is really this accumulated experiences that you've had, insights you develop as you interact with others and appreciate uh, bringing them into the dimensions that you're considering at the moment. And the, those thoughts uh, that I brought, up, brought about about broadening your perspective from the beginning they add insights to you in value judgments that you make. And, and as you address different problems, those insights begin to reflect on that. The problems may vary, the solutions may vary, but the approach is really bringing in that accumulated knowledge and experience and insight that you've gathered through life and being reflective enough to identify them to impact the particular problem that you're working on at that particular time. So it just, it is, the, the application is broad. It is scaled up or down depending on the, situa the situation you encounter. Those insights are who you have become now, and, and they, would, they would continue to grow in you and be powerful in addressing problems that may, you may encounter. You know, I, I would agree with everything that the old master panelists have said. I would additionally offer that each of us are a product of our own experiences in life. And that starts from the minute you're born. What was your upbringing? What were the things that you learned from your family around the dinner table? What did you learn from your siblings? And when it comes to being in the workforce, I, I don't think that there are any bad experiences. There may be uncomfortable ones, depending upon what's going on. But each one offers a learning opportunity. And the ability to learn from every situation and carry it in, you know, forward, to me, is, is very important. I've been lucky. I've worked in sales, in marketing, in management, in new product development, in process engineering, in R&D. Uh, I've been on governance committees. But my contributions, I don't limit to my role. I limit them based upon my experiences. And what I always try to do first is seek to understand from other individuals before I ever try to make myself understood to others. Because there may be people 
that have very different experiences, very different points of view that can really help inform a decision that can help inform where we go forward as a company. And those experiences that we all bring are so unique and they can make uh, you and your work all the more fulfilling when you fully understand and appreciate how the multifacets can come together for the greater good. So I think you should experiment in your careers. I, I think you should take advantage of every opportunity that's before you. I've had some roles that were more um, enjoyable, shall we say, than others. But what I will tell you is I've tried to learn from each and every one and be a better person and leader as a result. So now, uh, yeah. for panel one, we have we have time just for our rapid a rapid fire question, just to get to know you guys more on a uh, you all more on a personal a personal basis. So, what book are you currently reading? <laughs> we'll start with Elaine. Just go down. I, I have three on my bedside table <laughs> um, that might say a little bit about my lack of commitment to any one of them, but I like to <laughs> sort of alternate business and pleasure. So um, I'm currently reading a book by Jim Collins on how the mighty fall. It's a great book. <laughs> now, I have sort of the pa during the pandemic, I have started listening to books now instead of reading them. And I've gone through big books and I picked up a small book very recently, Saving Grace. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, it's a gem that I recommend to everyone. Yeah. I'm reading a book called Flux. It's by an author called April Rinney, and it's Eight Superpowers for Thriving in a Changing World. And it takes the basic concepts that we always hear about and turns them upside down in terms of leadership and success and well being. And I highly recommend it. It was written during COVID, and it's definitely a post COVID. <laughs> Survival book. <laughs> yeah, I also have a couple, a few books. Uh, I, I'd have to say the Bible first because it is a constant book that I read for wisdom and encouragement. And but I read a, from sort of a business point of view. I'm doing some climate investing now, and I'm reading Drawdown about climate and sustainability. And I, um, I'm in a part of a book club, and I'm reading a very thick but very interesting book called Shantaram. Just finishing uh, a book called Ranger School by uh, Jimmy F. Blackman, 30 years uh, in the military. This is his fourth book. And it's really the trials and tribulations of um, Jimmy going through Ranger School and how um, it, it, it will pale every issue, problem, challenge you have to know that the human body, the human mind can go through a lot of things and uh, accomplish a tremendous more than what we all think. Um, it's a fantastic book. Thank you. Yeah, and that is all the time we have tonight for panel one. We still have panel two coming up, but let's give a, a round of applause, please. Now, uh, it, wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be late night with the old masters without a show. So we have the Golden Girl coming up and panel two. So stay in your seats.
Baylor College of Medicine. Cassandra A.G. Chandler, founder and principal consultant at Systematic Design Consultants, LLC. And last but not least, Amy Hess, former chief of public safety for Louisville Metro government and former, spe former special agent and executive assistant director of the FBI. Again, welcome to our second segment of Late Night with the Old Masters. We're thrilled to have you here with us for our second panel of the evening. And as we start today's panel, we're thinking about what's apparent in your careers, which is a, noticeable, a notable value of hardship. So to kick us off, how have you responded to adversity in your careers and used your experiences for constructive change? Amy, can we start with you? Sure. I would say that uh, for me personally, over 29 years in the FBI, I experienced uh, a lot of different situations and whether it was uh, um, internal uh, adversity when it comes to personnel issues or supervision or external when it came to crisis events or managing crisis events. But I've got to say, personally, probably the most adversity I feel like I experienced in my overall career was as the chief of public safety for the global metro government during 2020. I, I started that job in February of 2020 and within a month, of course, we had our first case of COVID. I was responsible for, among other things, the Department of uh, Emergency Services, Emergency Management was under my oversight, as well as several other departments. So while we were going through that, within a few weeks, a couple months after that, we had the um, social justice protest in response to the shooting of uh, Breonna Taylor. And at that point, Actually, the police department didn't fall under my oversight yet, but it was reorganized to be my responsibility within just a few days of those protests. And so while that happened, the police chief was fired. We had 100 continual days of nonstop protests in the city every day, every evening. And while that was going on, we started to see a spike in violent crime and homicides. And so I'm the new person. I'm coming into this. I'm a known commodity in the FBI, but, but I'm not a known commodity in local government in Louisville. And even though I'm from there, I have spent most of my career outside of Louisville. And so for me, the adversity was trying to figure out what my role was in that place and also being viewed, I'd say, rather suspiciously um, by members of the community, by the police department, by the mayor's office uh, where I worked, uh, by, by others, by city council, who didn't really know how to, how to take me and what my job and responsibilities and my, my viewpoints were. And so uh, to overcome that, that feeling, that adversity, uh, that, uh, that I discovered the tension between each of those elements was palpable during this time. We had these three different crises happening throughout 2020, and I felt like my job was really to try to bring people together. I tried to fall back on my strengths to know that, okay, I've, I've done that before. I've brought people together who have very different opinions try to bring the tension down, try to maintain a sense of uh, a projection of calm and confidence so that when we're going through this very tumultuous time, at least I'm trying to bring the temperature down in the room. The other thing is to try to think in terms of, of how, we can, how we can get to a better place, how we can get to a better place with COVID, with social justice pr protests, with, with the violent crime and homicide uh, problem. And, and then at the same time, recognizing that we, we need a new police chief. And so going through the process of I've hired people before, I've gone through that, I'm familiar with this, I can do this. So while I felt like I was being pulled in, in multiple three, four way directions in different places and really criticized from all of those directions, I felt like I've got to stay the steady course, I've got to maintain focus, 
I've got to try to get us and navigate us through this to get to a better place. And so it took every bit of what I had learned in public service for 29 years to try to make that happen. But I think when you're faced with that type of situation, you've got to fall back on what you know and to try to think positively, think ahead, get past the noise, and get to a place where we can actually effectuate positive change. Well said. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. Cassandra, what about you? In terms of adversity, I believe that that's just a part of life. Within my career, I've faced adverse situations, whether it was a project that was overrun or whether it was a situation where I have been challenged in my role as a leader. I always look at the, the particular situation as an opportunity for reinventing myself. It's also an opportunity to evaluate what part did I play in terms of bringing the adversity upon myself or what part did the organization play. So I think it's critical that as you, life is gonna have adversity. You're gonna be faced with challenges. And being able to draw on your leadership skills, being able to draw on those things that um, you, you know to be true. And oftentimes in adverse situations, sometimes you have to speak truth to power. And that power, that may cost you. As you were talking about the situations where you're in, it's, it's new. You don't understand why all this is coming and happening at the same time. But if you hold on to those things that, that you know are true for you in terms of your integrity, being able to, to um, and speaking truth to power, you, you come with solutions and knowledge. A lot of times when you face adverse situations, it's because folks have not done their due diligence and research to make sure that they understand the situation or they understand, for example, a project that's overrun. Maybe we didn't do the budgeting right. Maybe, maybe we should have done this differently. But always be willing to assess yourself, assess the organization, and be ready to come with solutions to make change and make a difference so that that adversity can be turned into something positive. And it's also a matter of reinventing yourself at times. So that's, that's, that's my example of just looking at adversity in your career and making it a positive thing in the end. Yeah. Scott, would you like to share? Yeah, th uh, thank you. And, and uh, Amy and Cassandra, I think, said it exceptionally well. Um, as students, you're going to have adversity. Uh, you're possibly dealing with adversity today. Uh, it never goes away. Um, uh, to build on what Cassandra said, I think self-awareness, knowing yourself, knowing your, your values and your beliefs, trusting those, um, but having optimism and, and confidence and believing in yourself. Um, ultimately, you're all leaders, and I think what, what we're going to communicate to you today is um, none of the challenges go away. We've just gained experiences on how best to cope, adapt, and be a lifelong learner. Continue to apply the learnings that you gain because you're gonna get better. Uh, I can only speak for myself, but uh, I don't know about being a master of uh, dealing with adversity, but I get better, I think, each and every time. Well said. Dr. Ludwig. So despite the fact that 27% of the general public has a disability, only about 3% of practicing physicians do, um, I actually almost didn't even apply to medical school because I was concerned and afraid that I might miss an exam finding by not being able to hear using a stethoscope. And um, I was concerned that people wouldn't even let me into medical school because of those exact same fears about patient safety. And it wasn't until I got connected with a group called AMFA, American Medical Professionals with Hearing Loss, that um, I was able to um, develop resources and learn how to navigate that space, learn how to find a stethoscope that would work for me and gain the confidence um, and understand what accommodations to even ask for to enable me to practice and learn effectively and safely in this space. Mm -hmm. And in addition, despite the fact that Marie Curie is the godmother and founder of my field, radiation oncology, she's the first person to win the Nobel Prize twice. Uh, my field is a very male-dominated field. At the time that I entered, it was about 12% women. Uh, now it's about 25%, uh, despite the fact that for the past 10 years, med school has been about 50-50. Uh, 
And interestingly enough, we know that physician-patient concordance is important to improve outcomes. Um, Patient-physician concordance in relation to race, ethnicity, language, gender, um, these things improve patient outcomes. And when we have a physician workforce that did not look like the, um, the patient that it takes care of, we have significant healthcare disparities. So one of the biggest things that I try to advocate for um, in my field is to try to work on developing a workforce of physicians that mirrors the, um, the patients. And one of the best ways to do that in medicine is through mentorship programs. Interestingly enough, even though physician-patient concordance is important for outcomes, mentor-mentee concordance is not necessary. Um, it's more about finding a mentor that is willing to be an ally and an advocate for you and open doors for you. Um, so I've been fortunate to be able to seek out mentors um, and actually have had no concordance with them, but they've been willing to open doors and look out for me. And now I made a point to uh, serve as a mentor for medically underrepresented students, uh, which is very inspiring to, to be able to work with them and help them navigate the space and the uncertainty and the imposter syndrome that is, is very prevalent in anybody who's underrepresented in medicine. Thank you all for sharing. Um, kind of changing gears a little bit from adversity. Um, Scott, we'll start with you. And this question is for you. How did you develop and recognize your leadership identity? And how do you recommend young professionals, such as young professionals and students in this room, build their identi identity as leaders in their organizations or in their young professional careers? Yeah, great question. As, as you think of, of your leadership identity, it, it's similar to my, my last uh, answer. Understanding who you are, having great self-awareness, being a, a constant learner and understanding how you can apply your beliefs and your values. Um, but most importantly, and, and I would state you're all doing it. You're here tonight. You're, you're learning from others. You're asking questions. You're getting involved. You're staying engaged. You have to be in the game to, to be a, a leader. But also understand and, and appreciate that there's great responsibility that comes with that. And every one of you is going to be unique with your leadership style, your ability to, to contribute and lead. But if you don't take that first step and apply yourself and do it, you're, you're going to underappreciate the value that you can contribute uh, from being a leader. Um, so as students, what I would state is don't put pressure on yourself to be the best leader you can be today. Understand and appreciate that you're going to learn. You're going to get better. But have mentors. right? Learn from others. Ask questions. Um, you know, I think we've all stated through, through the last two days, we've had great mentors and we've had great opportunities. But we had people that believed in us, trusted us, and put us in a position to also fail, right? And we talk about adversity. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. Learn from those mistakes and apply those learnings. Thank you. Dr. Ludwig, you have pushed boundaries of the known world in oncology. How do you maintain a vision when an end goal is, or an op, like when there's an unknown end goal or there's obstacles in your way and you have plans that have never been accomplished before? So I work at a large safety net hospital system where almost all of my patients are below 200% below the federal poverty line. Many of them are undocumented. The diseases that are my specialty are breast and gynecologic cancer. These are screen-detected cancers. But in a population that does not have access to health care, they typically present with very advanced cancers. Um, so, um, in these patients, treatment compliance is extremely important. If the treatment is going to succeed, they have to comply with their entire treatment regimen in a certain amount of time. For example, for cervical cancer and head and neck cancer, any delay past the seven weeks of treatment, one day delay, results in a 1% decreased chance of local control. So in this group of patients, they're facing um, a lot of issues with social determinants of health, with being able to 
uh, get child care, with getting time off work, with getting transportation. I have patients that take three buses just to come to the clinic. Um, so we need to be able to do things um, to make the treatment faster, easier, more tolerable for them. Um, so one of the things that my lab um, has been working on is to develop a cream for what we call radiation dermatitis. So uh, radiation for breast cancer and uh, head and neck cancer often causes sunburns. Um, and in patients that aren't able to afford some of the topical over-the-counter um, things to dress it can actually require treatment breaks to be able to let their skin heal. Um, so we've uh, developed this in mass models, just got uh, FDA IND approval and getting ready to start uh, clinical trials to hopefully be able to decrease the side effects and improve treatment compliance. Um, my lab is also, my research lab, this is my lab. Um, <laughs> Um, my research lab um, has also developed a 3D customizable um, device for um, internal radiation uh, for gynecological brachytherapy with the goal that this can be uh, downloaded and printed from uh, any provider in the world that is not able to afford equipment. And our device um, is designed to make the procedure uh, shorter and safer without having to poke needles through the skin. Um, so again, trying to uh, improve the patient experience to improve treatment compliance. Um, we just finished a recent um, study where we looked at quality of life predictors for treatment compliance to see what patients we can predict ahead of time might be at risk for non-compliance so we can intervene earlier. Um, clinical research is tiring, it's, um, it's a lot of work, but when I have a patient in clinic that is struggling with treatment compliance, it kind of gives me a little extra motivation to, to go back to the lab and see how I can do this better. Thank you. Very interesting to hear about that, Dr. Ludwig, so thank you for sharing. I think I want to jump over to Amy, and I think about the experience that you shared with us with Chief of Public Safety at Louisville. And I think it's significant that you transitioned to that role from the FBI. So on the surface, those roles sound very different going from federal to metropolitan involvement. So can you share with us what some of the biggest similarities and differences were between what was expected of you as a professional and also what were some of the biggest unknowns as you transitioned? Yeah, I would say that, uh, so I, I was very familiar with federal government, obviously, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I assumed incorrectly that local government would be fairly similar and I would pick it up fairly quickly. Uh, there were some similarities. There were things like, uh, for example, I viewed my role as uh, to represent the agencies I was overseeing. Um, ultimately, that was, uh, like I said, the, the police department, but it was also emergency management, the corrections, the fire department, and initially I had several other departments um, as well. And so I viewed my role as to represent them the same way that I had represented different divisions in the FBI. And that, and that, that was my, my job to, to not only represent them, but to translate for them. And at the same time, to challenge them to try to improve, to try to be better, uh, to try to, uh, to, to make things better and be in a better place. And so those were some of the similarities I saw. Some of the differences were, I mentioned earlier, this, uh, I believe I'd call it again suspicion, if you will, by all of the different entities, external, internal. In the FBI, I was a known commodity, but now I'm not, and people not, are not really sure what to think of me and what you know, whose quote side I'm on, and so I'm I'm the outsider. Now all of a sudden, I'm not only the outsider here amongst the community, but I'm also the outsider internally within these organizations. And so that was a, a, a difference. The other piece was, uh, for me, the difference was in the FBI, I actually, when I left, I had a staff of people who, I had a comms person, a communications person, I had a budget person, I had a strategy person, uh, a chief of staff, a special assistant, those, all those people. Now, it, that, that's me. All of those roles, that's, that's me. You know, this is local government at bare bones. And so I had to learn how to manage all of those things. 
uh, at the same time. And I'd say probably as far as the unknowns go, there were huge gaps I realized that I needed to learn in local government. There is an overwhelming sense of urgency in local government to whether, whether somebody wants you to respond immediately because someone's breaking into their home or they want you to fix a pothole. Both of those people have like the same sense of urgency uh, about it. And you can't just say, we'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that was uh, an unknown and a difference that I saw. The other piece was uh, we, I had not had any experience with, um, uh, with organized labor, with, with unions. And so that was another whole learning curve that I had to process. And then, of course, throughout 2020, everything I think we encountered seemed to be unexpected. And so we, I really felt like there was a lot of flexibility and adaptability that had to be built into the way I viewed things and the way I proceeded through that year. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that's definitely a lot of things to take on and think about um, just to be able to serve the people around you. So thank you for sharing about that. Cassandra, as we transition to you, uh, mm -hmm. like Amy, you also do a lot within your career, including making mentorship a large cornerstone and pillar of mm -hmm. the way that you guide yourself as a professional. So I'm curious, what are part of your experiences that have motivated you to take on such a great value of being a mentor and while doing that making sure that you invite voices to the table that really need to be there and hear your story so that way they can also be motivated well i would say that all of my experiences whether positive or negative have motivated me to be an advocate for diversity and bring diverse voices to the table being a in a field that is predominantly male, mm -hmm. and oftentimes I'm the only female, and most importantly, a lot of times I'm the only woman of color in the room, it makes, it, it puts a huge level of responsibility on me. I take it very um, personally, and I want to make sure that I am an advocate for people who look like me to be at the table. And when you get to the table, it's important that you bring others. And you have to be deliberate in those efforts. So I have made it a point to be deliberate, to bring, to inspire, to be deliberate in my efforts to recruit and share, bring to the table the intellect, the life experiences, the energy, and the diversity of underrepresented groups. You'll find that it's for companies, the companies that value that are more profitable. The products that are produced by organizations that value, not, not only value, but actually recruit for diversity will, will produce better products. And you also have products that serve the communities that, that are important. Some of the things that you talked about, not understanding um, what the underrepresented groups, whether it's the women or whether it's those folks who, who, who don't have the resources to participate in some of the medical t studies. Those same things happen when you're talking about technology and being exposed to it early. Building a pipeline of, of women underrepresented minorities that understand STEM and science. That makes a difference. And you have to start that process early. So understanding that for corporations, it brings value. It's important. And you get a better product. You get a better uh, profit margin. And for organizations, I transition um, from going into prof uh, for-profit companies to working at a university, understanding that like the students here, you all are the product. The things that we did in terms of the research for the professors, et cetera, it made a difference in your lives. So it's important that we bring that diversity to the table. I even recruited for my teams. If I was looking for a student tech, I'd make sure I went to organizations, whether it was women in science and engineering, or, or the Hispanic student organizations, you've got to be deliberate with those efforts. Um, and being able to share my story with others for them to understand that the challenges that I face. And you also have to be willing to speak truth to power. 
sometimes that costs, but I want to make sure that the barriers that I've broken down are not erected again for the next generation. So I consider it a part of my mission. I consider it a part of um, making not only my, um, the, the STEM careers more diverse, but also it's better for society in, in general. So give of yourself, use your leadership, be transparent in your stories that you share and being willing to speak truth to power. Yeah, that's vital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think a lot of, yeah. <laughs> a lot of Boilermakers on campus have, have been doing that as of late, which has been, been really beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. And that kind of segues into our next question, which is for everybody. We'll start with you, Dr. Ludwig. Being a Boilermaker means something different to everyone. What does it mean to you, and what has it meant uh, within your career? So to paraphrase Isaac Newton, if I have seen far, it is from standing on the shoulders of giants. I am absolutely here today because of the number of giants that have been a part of my Purdue journey. That journey started when I was two years old. I lost my hearing, lost my balance from uh, spinal meningitis. At that time, the custom was to uh, send a patient to the school for the deaf and uh, teach sign language and um, not include oral communication as part of that. Um, fortunately, I was able to be accepted into the Purdue Speech and Audiology Department and uh, work with some giant, uh, the late uh, Dr. Carl Benny and Professor Emeritus Jeanette Leonard, who were really pioneers in the field of language acquisition for children. They believed in me, they believed I could um, continue, learn how to speak, learn how to lip read, um, learn how to navigate the world of hearing aid, uh, be able to be fitted appropriately, and learn how to navigate utilizing the residual sound I had. At the same time, um, I was able to work with the Department of Kinesiology. They had a program called DME, Developmental Movement Experience where well, they took me and taught me how to walk again. Um, one of the ways that you balance um, in order to walk, if you don't have your hearing, it's with your eyes. So they had to teach me how to walk, like on a balance beam um, with uh, spotting something at the end of it. Um, eventually progressed to teach me gymnastics um, and other things that would involve um, kind of more complicated balance skills. Um, I remained part of that group for the next 10 years with the speech and audiology department until I learned how to advocate for myself and request the accommodations that I needed. Fast forward 10 years and I was a freshman at Purdue. They had a uh, system for me called Computer Assisted Real Time. And remember this was before the internet, um, before uh, artificial intelligence speech recognition. So somebody would come to class with me and it was kind of like a, a court reporter, a stenographer, and she would sit next to me and type uh, all of my lectures. If you think about, uh, I was in pharmacy school at the time, but you think about medical terminology, abduct, adduct. It sounds very, very similar, but if I get one word wrong, the entire lecture is, is kind of messed up. And then if I had to look down and take notes, then I missed the next thing that was said. Um, so Purdue was a very early adapter of that technology, which uh, made it possible for me to get through and, and do well in school, um, and also develop the confidence um, to go on to medical school. Kind of from the professional side, um, as a freshman, I got accepted to the Freshman Pharmacy Honor Scholars Program and had the opportunity to work with another giant in the pharmacy school, Dr. Nick Popovich. This was my first experience into clinical research. I knew about lab research, but I knew that wasn't interesting to me. Um, and uh, he helped me learn how to apply the same scientific method that I had learned in high school um, to develop a research question, um, answer it, uh, analyze it, present it, um, and worked with me even though I had no experience in this. Um, and to this day, um, 
I credit him for spiking my research experience and think about him every time I mentor a student, helping them hold their hand through the, the steps of developing the research. So these giants have been, uh, and many others that I haven't had a chance to name today, have been a very integral part of my career, and I wouldn't be here today without them. And now we'll round out our panel with another rapid fire. So Amy, we'll start with you. Who is your biggest inspiration? I'd say, actually, just the other day I was reading about this woman who's like 70 years old and she ran seven marathons in seven, on seven continents in seven days. And I thought, wow. I mean, so people like that who inspire you to not give up and to not take no for an answer and to not put limits on yourself. That is so powerful. I just, uh, I, I don't know this woman. I don't know anything about her, but it inspired me to, you know, I want to run a marathon. I, you know, I, I, I'm not 70 yet and I would love to run seven marathons in seven, you know, seven continents, seven days. That's just an inspiring to me. People who don't give up, who don't put limits on themselves, people who, uh, who, who don't see barriers. Yeah. Man, she must have been real sore. <laughs> Cassandra, what about you? I think throughout my life, my greatest imp inspiration were my parents. Mm -hmm. The sacrifices that they made so that I could come to a, a university like Purdue that I really didn't want to go to. It was Dr. Cornell A. Bell, who's the director of the Business Opportunity Program that got me here. And so he was also an inspiration. But it, it was his conversation with my parents who said, you are going to Purdue. <laughs> and that made all the difference in the world. So their sacrifices being the first generation college graduate. And the, at times, there was a lot of pressure. At times, I knew they, they told me, you, you need to be the best at everything that you do. You have to do the right thing. And their standard of right was a godly standard. And sometimes the devil was on one shoulder and the angel was on the other. <laughs> Times when I felt like I had to represent my race, it was Martin Luther King over here and I don't know who else. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it was a lot, mm -hmm. but they inspired me to do well and they inspired me to always be the best and they had, in, inspired me to know that at times I felt like I, I carried that in, the entire race on my shoulders. And now I'm at a point where I don't have to do that, but I want, and, and I'm so inspired by the young folks who, who are doing their own thing. You all are gonna solve the problems of, of this world, the, the division that we have. But I'm inspired by seeing you all be willing to sit down and be challenged. So it was my parents, it was that inspiration, it was Dr. Bell. And I knew I had to do the right thing because I represented so many people who had worked so very hard. That's a lot of pressure, but that was my time and that was my generation. So that's what inspired me. Scott. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have chosen a career in, in biotech and medtech where I'm inspired to be part of teams where we can give back, help people, help patients, um, extend life. Uh, I find that very fulfilling and enriching and on a daily basis when you're part of a team that collaborates on, on giving back in that way and enriching people's lives, extending their lives. Uh, I, I take great inspiration each and every day that we can get better at it. We can more positively impact a, a broader group on a daily basis. Um, but I would also state I'm inspired by you. Having had an opportunity to spend two days back on campus, um, not that I've ever lost faith in Purdue, um, but I am super, super impressed with the caliber of, of, of leaders um, that the university is attracting and building. Um, and as Cassandra said, we have great trust that the future leaders of the world are here and it gives me great inspiration that I've got to elevate my game to better represent you and the university. So thank you. Dr. Ludwig. Would you like to share your story of, or who is your biggest inspiration? Oh, I think um, kind of relating to my comments earlier, I've got two biggest inspirations. My patients 
um, my patients that are navigating a complex healthcare system with very limited resources, with um, low um, health literacy, um, and often in another language. They're, they're very inspiring and humbling when I see um, how hard they're working to try to make a better life for their kids, to navigate a, a deathly diagnosis. Um, and my other inspiration is my students. Um, I have students that are, um, are immigrants themselves, are first generation college students, first physicians in their family. Um, I have students that have struggled through adversity and, and hearing their stories and, and their challenges and their motivation is, is very inspiring. Thank you again for being with us tonight. And thank you to the old masters who are no longer on stage for sharing your stories of resilience and the important lessons that you've learned who have led you to who you are today. So thank you again. And let's give them another round of applause. We would like to say thank you all for coming to Late Night with the Old Masters. We hope you'll carry some of the lessons uh, that have been spoken about tonight with you. Um, if you'd like to know more about the uh, Old Masters program or get involved, you can find us online, okay, cool. uh, PurdueOldMasters.org, as well as our, our podcast on there. Spotify. So thank you for coming out. Thanks again for coming, and boiler up, hammer down. <laughs>